This is the third interview in a series of three with Mark Jacobson, who is a well-known professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, and is uh, uh, basically known for his plans to electrify economies using only wind, water, and solar. We're going to talk about modeling this time because this is a controversial area around energy demand and supply. So welcome to the interview, Mark. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mark. You have, sir, have been a little controversial uh, with your modeling because you've modeled for the entire world, the energy, how to, how to electrify the entire global economy. You've done it for 145 individual economies. And, and no surprise, I guess, you know, some critics have come out and, and criticized your assumptions and, and what have you. That's a yeah, fair game, right? That's what happens in the, uh, in the academic world. Um, but how do you model for the various countries? I mean, do you have a, a computer model? You get, where do you get your data? That kind of thing. Well, I've been developing computer models since 1989. And my first modeling was to build an air pollution model, which started in Los Angeles. I built an air pollution model from, for Los Angeles. So what an air pollution model is, it uh, simulates the emissions of chemicals, gases, and particles the transformation of those chemicals in the atmosphere through gas chemistry, through gas particle transfer and interactions and chemistry, interparticle chemistry and other physical interactions, uh, cloud formation eventually, uh, then the transport of these gases and particles there, and, when it, and then the radio transfer through the atmosphere, which affects the chemical reactions, but also affects temperatures. So actually one of the things I did was to because in the past, before that, you know, air pollution models and weather prediction models were separate. Uh, like an air pollution model was not interactively tied with a weather prediction model. Uh, and so it, it would sometimes use offline winds that were predicted separately and then just fed in through a data set. Uh, but that you can just do a limited amount of things because the data sets couldn't be that large at the time. Um, so one of the things I did was to build the first model in the world that interactively, air pollution model in the world that interactively fed, uh, connected the weather prediction with air pollution modeling with feedback in both directions. And then eventually I did that not only on the local scale, but I, I extended that to the global scale. So built the first interactive model at the global scale that fed weather prediction to both gas and aerosol transformation and transport and the feedback of both gas and particles and size result particles and chemically resolved particles back to the weather prediction model through mostly through radiative transfer. And then did a model that would nest in between the global and regional scale, local scales so you can actually telescope in on high resolution regions. I mention this because, I mean, I use, I use that to study particles and their impacts on climate. So finding, for example, that black carbon may this be the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide. I was able to do that because of the complexity of this model. But fast forward, I still use that model today to predict the weather for predicting winds and solar radiation fields in the countries that we're examining around the world, including Canada, but all, now we have up to 150 countries. And so I can predict at 30 second time resolution, the winds and solar radiation fields, and also uh, waves and precipitation and also temperatures in buildings. So I can, or how much heating demand is need in, needed in buildings. So that's one kind of model. But then the other type of model I built is a grid model, which is to balance supply of or demand for electricity on the grid with supply, storage, demand response. And so I built my first one starting in 2014 and for grid, look at grid analyses, but then I would use the weather prediction from the weather prediction model to feed it into the grid analysis model to then determine if we can keep the grid stable with 100% renewables across all energy sectors in all the countries that we've examined. Now, one of the reasons I ask this is because Premier Danielle Smith in Alberta is fond of saying, criticizing the International Energy Agency's modeling by saying, well, it's just, it's not based in reality, it's just based on a computer, which I think your, uh, your, your story blows apart because of course it's based on, on real data that then gets fed into, into the model. A, a very wise economist named Chris Bataille, who lives in Vancouver, does a lot of modeling out of Columbia University. And he once told me, he said, you know, there's the math, but then there's the assumptions behind the math. 
And as a non-mathematician myself, I, that's where I go when I think about modeling is to the assumptions, because that has so much to, to do with then how you do the math and how you handle the data. And I, what I find interesting is that a lot of the criticisms were about your assumptions, many of which, as it turned out, were true. Technology got better and more efficient and did the things you said it would do. Yeah, so ultimately model predictions are only as good as its assumptions, but I, I want to point out that you need modeling. I mean, people who dismiss modeling out of hand, that's a little disingenuous for them because you know everything we do in our head is like a model. It's like a simple model. So to say like, because they're saying that we should be able to predict things based on our own intuition. So that's just saying, okay, we're predicting things based on the calculations you're doing in your head. So a computer model does what you do in your head, but more, more elaborately with more data, a lot more resolution. So it, everybody's doing modeling all the time. I mean, every, everything we say is some kind of model that we're, for, but it's based on what our head. So, so people who don't want to use models, they just say, we want to just guess what's going to happen. They're just as, you know, they're, it's a little bit arrogant because they're saying that they're smarter than all the computers in the world. And that's, which is not the case, but, but it is a valid point to say the actual model results are dependent on the, on the assumptions, but yeah, assumptions, you know, I mean, there are a lot of different assumptions, but we use data as much as we can. And we use, as I mentioned, for weather prediction, we use high resolution uh, calculations, which are sometimes better than data because sometimes data are only available at an hour resolution. We have 30 second resolution, for example. Um, but we, and we don't assume that we're going to go to 100% re renewable, for example. That's, uh, that is our, I mean, we're just making, we're going to, we're saying that that's, we're checking out what's going to happen if we do go to 100% renewable. We want to go to 100% renewable. So we're going to see what happens if we do go to 100% renewable. We're not saying, we're not predicting that we will go to 100% renewable. I mean, that'll depend on society if society decides that. So there's also sometimes a mistake about people saying that we're assuming the, the transition to 100% renewable when that's not a, the assumption we're making. We're just, that's just an input that we're basing. If we do go to 100% renewable, this won't happen. Um, I want to give you an example of what happens when you do bad modeling in your head. And this comes courtesy of Haytham L. Guy, who is the Secretary General of OPEC. And three weeks ago, four weeks ago, he was in Kananaskis, Alberta at the Global Energy Show. Uh, and he was a keynote speaker and he was widely quoted saying, uh, he said, the best indicator that the demand for oil will continue to grow long into the future is that it has grown for a long time in the past. He simply took the past and extrapolated it into the future and never considered for a moment that the primary uh, demand for his product, oil, is transportation. And the Chinese, in particular, are, are electrifying transportation at a terrific pace. And so it's the, if you don't model with uh, a computer and make your assumptions transparent so they can be you know, discussed by a by, journalists and economists, uh, then what happens is you do the kind of fallacious uh, modeling in your head that Haytham L. Guy did. Well, yeah. So that's actually a great example because what he did is what's called in weather forecasting, that's called persistence forecasting. So when you say the weather tomorrow is going to be the same as the weather today, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's about as simple as you get. So yeah, you, you don't, that's like a yeah, very simple model, but then, you know, you have actual physical models of the atmosphere that can predict the weather better with better accuracy than your persistence forecast. Um, so yeah, you need to account for what might happen tomorrow, what's actually happening on the ground today in terms of what might affect tomorrow. So that's another level, and it just illustrates how actual modeling is more useful than just modeling in your head. Now, we, uh, you and I have had this conversation in another call, but we talked about energy media's uh, energy transition theory of change. And we're not modelers, we're not computer, but what we do is we track uh, and we report on uh, uh, disruptive innovations. And this is uh, Clayton Christensen from the Harvard Business School, his idea. And in a, in a disruptive innovation is like an electric vehicle. It's like a battery. It's like wind, wind technology, uh, you know, solar tech, solar panels or wind turbines. And it changes the business model and it, it competes against the existing technologies, in this case, fossil fuels. And what happens is when you see dis, uh, an industry being disrupted and automobiles, 
there is absolutely no doubt anymore that China and, and EVs are completely disrupting the global auto sector and electrifying it at a, at a considerable rate. And then, then you can, you can uh, make some educated guesses about what's next. And this is where oil comes in and where Haytham al Ghai is so wrong is because if the automobile in, uh, industry gets disrupted and electrified, what is up, upstream of the autos? It's oil, which provides the gasoline and diesel. And so that's a way to use modeling to disprove and uh, the kind of fallacious reasoning that Haytham al Ghai used. Well, in fact, I think I saw a story just yesterday where oil demand is now going down because of that's, well, the thing is hypothesized due to the fact that you have so many EVs from China coming in that it's actually caused a reduction of demand already. So I think that's, yeah, his hypothesis is already, his uh, forecast has already been disproven. Yes, and, that, and that's true. And that, that's the, if you look at the International Energy Agency's oil market 2025 modeling, uh, Chinese uh, has, they, China has reached peak oil demand now. Not 2030, not 20, it is today. And it's because of electrification of transportation. And it's it's yeah. as simple as that. Well, so, yeah, hopefully it'll go down even more, but I mean. So what do you, I want to close up the interview this way, uh, Mark. And is it fair to say, like you said earlier, you know, it's fair to, to look at somebody's modeling and, and question their assumptions. I mean, that goes on all the time between, between modelers. And is this the kind of conversation we need to have in public because I, you know, I talk about, well, OPEC models this and has these assumptions. IEA models this and has these assumptions. Which ones are more likely based on the data and where we see trends going? And I think, I mean, in our world, that's been a useful conversation. And it seems to me that it would be a useful conversation to have, you know, at a national level and with policymakers and so on. Well, I think, yeah, when you have conflicting results from two different groups, then going into the assumptions is really critical. When you when results are all in the same direction, then maybe there's less need for looking at the details. But yeah, definitely when you have conflicting results, that's uh, useful. But, and especially among specialists, I mean, specialists, will, you know, you want to know if you're reading a paper, you know, what are the assumptions going into this calculation? Because something might just sound like, oh, that sounds like a reasonable conclusion, but then you could look in the details of what they did and, and you wonder, well, how did they get that conclusion? So you have to go into the details. So there should be checks for sure. Um, you know, you don't want so many predictions coming out and there's no, turns out there's no basis for those predictions at all. Um, so I think some oversight is is really useful and it's also helpful to get feedback because, you know, I've used feedback for the last 16 years in the in our energy modeling. You know, every year in every paper that we publish, you get some feedback that I say, oh yeah, this is, or reviewers will review papers and they'll give suggestions and say, oh, you didn't look at this, you didn't look at that. Or what happens if you do a sensitivity of this? Then I learn from everything and I try to improve my modeling. And so what I model today really represents the improvements over not only the last you know 17 years of or 16 years of energy modeling, but over the last 35, six years of all modeling. I mean, it, model results just get better and better and more and more not only accurate, but more representative because of all the improvements that people have suggested. So I, lo I love getting good feedback. It's the feedback I don't like is when people are just trying, you know, they're just misrepresenting what you're saying. And then they're trying to then make broadcast that publicly and say, well, you can't believe it because, oh, you know, his assumption is wrong without actually checking whether that is correct or not. Because people like to do that. They like, there are gr groups of people like to smear you and try to bring you down. So that's not very constructive. But, you know. well, welcome, welcome to the energy debate, uh, circa twenty twenty five. That's just, uh, yeah, that's a, a, I'm sure it was a feature of it back in nineteen eighty nine when you did your first model. Look, thank you very much for this. It's been a very interesting conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mark.